I arrived on scene, there was a fair amount of damage. It appeared that there may have been some type of a vapor explosion. Pressure built up inside when gasoline was ignited that pushed the glass out from the frame. There was a bedroom that had some fire damage, and in that area was where there was a red plastic gasoline container that seemed extremely out of place. Some of these things just didn't seem normal for a regular fire. Once we looked inside, we found out that there was a body of a female, and there was a mattress on top of her. After removing some debris, it was noticed that her hands were, in fact, bound with what appeared to be duct tape. It turned it into a homicide investigation at that point, and belief that someone was trying to cover something up by setting the place on fire. Our victim at the scene was uh, Melissa Norby. Melissa's cousin had called me that morning and says, please tell me it's not true. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she goes, Melissa's house is on fire. And I'm like, what? My daughter is over there. An officer contacted me and said that there was a female at the barricades that said her daughter um, had spent the night with Melissa. So I went out. I saw Amanda. We searched through again. We were confident there was no other human remains in the fire. It went from a homicide investigation to now we had an active missing child case. This girl's been missing since roughly 3 o'clock in the morning. We're worried that time is not on our side. Melissa's cousin was interviewed by agents uh, regarding uh, Melissa's relationships with other males. Her cousin told the agents that she was aware that Melissa had been seeing a male recently uh, from the Bemidji area. Melissa referred to him as Jake. She was also able to provide that this individual also owned a, like a food truck. We called the city clerk looking for our food truck licensees. And she told us Jake's Eats is owned by Jacob Ken. We all knew his name. Jacob Ken had child pornography convictions. He had tried to purchased a young girl online for photographing purposes. Based on his past history, based on his relationship with Melissa, Jacob Kinn was likely our guy. The first thing we do, we reach out to the cell phone company and begin to get locations for Jacob's cell phone. Yeah, did you hear about the fire? Um, yeah. OK. I do know that lady, actually. Um, and what's her name? Melissa Norby. If that's right. Yeah. When's the last time that you've seen her? Like six or eight months ago. Oh, so it's been a long time. Yeah. And he didn't know that Melissa had talked to her cousin about Jacob being back in her life. So he probably thought that we weren't aware of that information. You know, there was a fire. You know, there was a body found. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what happened, OK? Where'd you just come from? Um, well, I was fishing up north. Okay. Fishing where? Um, Clear Lake. Clear Lake? Yeah. He told us that he had been fishing by North Home, Minnesota. But his actual location was near Big Fork, Minnesota. And those two locations were approximately 30 miles apart. So we knew that was likely a lie. This, uh, Melissa? Did you ever have sex with her? Never? Even years ago? No. Do you have any way to get hold of her? Or... No. Yeah. Did she ever want to have sex with you? Did she tell you that? She texted flirty stuff, but... And when was the last time that you got a text message from her? Like, it's true. Has already told us some stuff that contradicts what he told us before. I didn't have a way to get a hold of her, but she's flirty in her text messages. Jake, we got reports that you had a relationship with Melissa. There was never actually a relationship. 
Um, Which is what I already said. You're late. Yeah. Basically, Jake your cell phone doesn't put you in that spot tonight. When Jacob Kennedy showed up at the Sheriff's Department, we observed right away that his boots were wet, his pants were wet. We walked outside and took a look at his vehicle and saw flower material and weeds. So it looked like he'd been driving off of the road. Jacob parked right in front of the law enforcement center. His vehicle looked like he had been driving out in a field, certainly not to a resort to go fishing like he said he was. This guy, have you seen this before? You look familiar? No. Well, it's familiar. I own a few gas cans. You own one like that? I own one like it, and it's at my house. That gas can was found at the arson site. Okay. He probably thought the gas can went up in the fire and was surprised that there was actually a gas stand fully intact still at the at the fire scene. The entire focus of our evening is this little girl. Yeah. I didn't do anything to the little girl. I haven't seen the little girl. I haven't seen Melissa in a long time. I haven't done anything. Part of the problem with the data that we got from the cell phone was it landed out in the middle of a very rural area in Big Fork. We took the latitude and longitude coordinates provided by the uh, Verizon telephone company. We were able to map those coordinates and it put the uh, cell phone in as to possibly being 5.2 miles northeast of the cell phone tower in Big Fork, Minnesota. We found a property listed to a relative, but Jacob, that was right in alignment with where that phone ping showed up at. We were looking for any spots where a vehicle might have pulled off or turned around. It had rained the night before, and as we're driving up to the intersection of Township Road 288, which is a dirt road, heading west off of the paved two-lane road that we were driving on, we could see a, a set of vehicle tracks. To us, it looked like the tire tracks were very similar to uh, Jacob Kinn's tracks on his Jeep that we had looked at previously. We got to the uh, west end of the Township Road, and saw that the tire tracks had come out of a, a field road that also proceeded west and down a hill and uh, into a low area. We parked the squad and uh, proceeded on foot. The grass was about knee high and we followed the tracks. It was probably at least a half mile walk. I was afraid that we were gonna find a little girl's body somewhere along that trail. As we got up over the rise on the top of the field, we could see a pickup camper tucked back into the woods. The tracks pulled right up to the south side of the camper. I walked up to the camper and the door was tied tight with a big wad of electrical tape. I was nervous and I opened up the camper door. I didn't know what we were gonna find. Hi, what did you say your name was again? I'm gonna take a little video. <laughs> How'd you get here? It's his friend back here. Don was right next to me. Turn on your cell phone, he said. We didn't have body cameras and stuff at the time. Okay, you don't have to be scared, okay? We're the police. I saw a little girl sitting on a bed. Looked like she just woke up. My name's Rob and this is Don. How old are you? Probably five or something. Finding that little girl alive, I, I don't know if words can describe it. 6.15 a.m. is when I got the call from Don. He said, we have her. I said, alive? He said, alive. Uh, what went through your mind at that, at that moment? That was fantastic. Never would have believed. Do you remember what Missy's friend looked like? What kind of car does he have? Wait, and it has a name on it. She told us all these little bits of describing information that described Jacob Ken to us. What does he look like? He has a beard. Did you go there for her or for Melissa? 
We wore so but it was... Did you know that she was going to be there? Yeah. As investigators got through Jacob Ken's phone and Melissa Norby's phone, there was information that they had planned this together, that Jacob would have a relationship with her if she gave him access to a child. Melissa being involved to the extent that she was, it was a shock to everyone. 